I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, we're going to be answering the viewer question of what is exactly the difference between a barrio and a reparto? You see us talk about these all the time. We mention different places, the Barrio Sutiava, the Reparto Veracruz. Well, we're going to be digging into that and explaining what is the difference between them on today's show. And this is specific to Nicaragua. These terms are different everywhere you go. So buckle up, stay tuned. We're going to dive into this with Mia the dog. Before we get too deep into today's topic, I want to do a really quick microphone test. This is my voice speaking to the Rode Go 2 as attached to, with a lot of wind all of a sudden, attached to the uh, GoPro 12. So this is a full boom mic that is mounted on it, but it's all processing through the camera. And this is the microphone built into the media mod on the GoPro 12. So this is what I normally record with, but when I'm doing other things, I use the Rode. I wanna compare them just because if we can make the audio a little bit better, at least some of the time, would love to do so. Okay, so today's question. Barrio and Reparto. So this is important that we understand that first of all, these terms are unique by country and by region. So in the United States, we're used to the term Barrio referring to a poor Hispanic neighborhood of any city. It is specifically Hispanic and specifically poor. If you have a rich one, it wouldn't be a barrio. Like people use barrio in a negative connotation in the United States. So we're kind of used to hearing that. Here in Nicaragua, barrio and reparto are both political designations of a city. So what do we mean by that? First of all, that means you have a city that is an incorporated entity with definitive barriers, right? We're all familiar with city concepts. So a legal city that has a mayor or here it's called the Alcadia uh, is in charge of that city and they have city municipal services and it is you know legally defined as a city all those things no surprises there a city can then be divided into subdivisions but official ones these are ones that have some official amount of their own rulemaking or services or whatever they are legally defined political entities that doesn't mean that they have their own mayor necessarily but they may have some type of representation and in the united states we often refer to these as wards so if you're in chicago for example you can go to different wards and they have potentially different rules or different representation into the city government or maybe services are just broken up by wards or maybe the style or area uh, is is different and we're used to uh, New York City is broken up into the boroughs and then further broken up into very strong neighborhoods like Soho or Tribeca within Manhattan versus Brooklyn. So we're, we're used to cities being broken up into subdivisions. Well, the same thing happens here in Nicaragua, but we don't have any super large cities. So we're only dealing with small and medium sized cities, but the basics are the same. We have subdivisions that are political, so they have their own services and are clearly demarcated, at least by the government. These are barrios and repartos, and this is true in every city in the country. And most maps, uh, like Google Maps and stuff, will show loads and loads of the barrios. So when you're looking at the map, you're like, okay, it's this barrio, that barrio. People use them as addresses, all that kind of stuff. Now, those can be further subdivided as well into things that are non-political entities. And we commonly uh, speak about those as things like vias, which is like house, villa in Italian is via in Spanish. Uh, and that can be an unincorporated non-political zone, as can uh, colonia. These are really common. You can also have comunidad. These are seen very commonly, and they would be like uh, an area where people have uh, some stylistic in their architecture, some shared history, maybe they're slightly separate from the barrio in some way, or they're, they're just too small to be their own entity in some legal way, so they just become a community or a colonia, which is a, a colony. Uh, so, in some of those terms exist in English as well, it's not super surprising to see them at use here. Those normally are going to lie within a barrio or a reparto, but sometimes they will lie where there isn't one, and they simply refer to a kind of unofficial, soft, designated zone. But it is important because they are they are official names that the government may use it to, for example, tell you that you're looking at a power outage or they're going to be doing maintenance on your streets next week, and they would mention your colonia or your via. Uh, 
Barrio is the most well-known term. Most Americans have heard it and have some idea what it means. And essentially, it is the same as the English word neighborhood, and a direct translation makes it the word neighborhood. But it is used a little bit differently. But just like in English, if you say neighborhood and you're referring to Mr. Rogers, you have one idea of what you're talking about. And if you're talking to someone in the inner city and they're like, man, I'm from the neighborhood, you understand that they're talking about something slightly differently. Barrio can work out the same way. Barrio can be used in a very, ah, this is my barrio. It's a designated area. And this is where I live. We just had the question about Barrio Sutiava, the largest barrio in Leon, and you know, how safe was it or whatever. But when you look at a map and you put it in Google Maps, there's a very clearly delineated zone known as the Barrio Sutiava. And it has a lot of subdivisions because it's quite large and has a very large population. If someone uses the expression like, man, I'm from the Barrio, even here in Nicaragua, it's going to connotate that you're from a kind of inner city urban area that might be a little bit more poor or more rough or whatever. But when you realize or understand what barrio technically means as a political designation, then that should make a little bit of sense why it tends to have that implication. So let's start with, in any given city, you have a downtown zone. This is where the cathedral is. This is where the plaza is or the main square. It's where the majority of your shops are. It's where the government offices are. It's where the Alcadia is. That is known as El Centro. And it's just that simple. El Centro is downtown, and it is its own political entity. It is not a barrio or reparto, but it is the third option. So, But there's one per city technically, normally, but here in Leon, there are two. There is El Centro at Leon, and there's El Centro at Sutiava. Sutiava is kind of a special beast because it is a barrio of Leon, but it is a city of its own right as well. So it has a lot of the behavior of having a center with its own barrios and itself being a barrio of Leon. It's a little bit like Dallas-Fort Worth. It's complicated. So Sutiava, while we use it a lot because I live here, also is problematic in describing barrios because it's a bit of a special case compared to most. So you'll be like, wait, that's weird, but it's only Sutiava. If you were to look at Guadalupe or, or uh, La Barrio or Saragossa, it, those in, in uh, Leon would behave completely normally or Calvarito, Calvario, uh, Primero de Mayo. Okay, so, but, so we have the city center. That is El Centro. The barrios that are immediately surrounding the center, generally touching it, but not necessarily, they can just be very close, are known as barrios. They're political entities that are designated near the center. And it is assumed that if you live or work or whatever in those barrios, that they will have a certain dependency for services upon the center. Of course, even far-flung farmland uses the city center for something, but if you're in the barrios, the assumption is that the city center is part of your everyday life. You would go there for restaurants, for shopping, or whatever. So the inner barrios tend to be very urban and often a little bit more poor. El Centro the downtown areas tend to be a little bit more affluent. Those who have old money or are able to afford old colonial houses or whatever tend to be in the city center near the beautiful plazas and the oldest buildings, the cathedral and that kind of stuff. So if you, if you have the financial resources, you often want to be in the city center. The area immediately surrounding the city center traditionally is where people would live when they work in the city center. So these are the bedroom communities where people who are looking to travel a little bit farther, we're talking blocks, not miles here. We're not talking about cars. We're talking about people who have to walk some distance to get to work rather than having to just walk out their door and be in the middle of the city center. Uh, these areas are, are definitely lower income uh, and people are expected to mostly commute into the city center. So that those are the barrios. Uh, and so because of that, we have this general connotation that they're going to be less expensive and probably a little bit more rough and not have nearly as many services. You're often surprised when you find restaurants and things in that area, but they certainly exist. I lived for a while in La Barrio, the oldest of all the barrios here in Nicaragua, and you can tell from its name that it was the barrio for the laborers. El Centro is where the business owners and the doctors and the lawyers and the politicians and the originally the colonizers, the Spaniards who came and took over the zone, that's where they lived. People who worked in El Centro, people who needed to be able to walk there, had the community of Laborio, the, the, the neighbor, the laborers. Uh, so that area was very old uh, and was a support community to the city center. 
Over time, more and more people needed to work in the city center as the city grew, more barrios sprung up, and eventually La Barrio became so close to the city center compared to other barrios that it started to gentrify simply because it was attractive to be so close to the center and in a place that's so old. So now it's no longer a laborer community for the most part, it has changed a bit, but only because the city has grown. So there's a gentrification process when you're really close to the center that's just natural. As you get farther out from the barrios, but still inside the city, this is important. When you're still inside the city, but you have something that is no longer day-to-day -day dependent and using the city center, you start to get repartos. This is different than a suburban area. A suburban area, you start to have wide open spaces and large tracks, and you expect there to be housing developments and things like that, gated communities. But when you're in a reparto, while those things can happen, you're not expecting them to happen or they're not the norm. They would be the exception rather than the rule. You're still in the city proper. You still have city style housing, but the houses might be just a little bit larger. The yards might be just a little bit larger there might be a little bit more trees uh, and you're starting to get little restaurants and, and much more community activity. So repartos have a tendency to spend time inclusive with themselves or they start to use cars, whereas the barrios, they don't tend to have cars. They don't tend to have garages too much. There's always places you can find. If they are going to have garages, they're old buildings that are converted that are not expecting them. So repartos are basically just barrios, but a designation saying they're farther out from the city center. So Specifically, here in this area, the Barrio Sutiava is a barrio, and when you're in the majority of it, you have close-knit buildings. As you walk around, things are close in, they're tight, and you never feel like you're out in the wide open. Whereas the Reparto Veracruz, which is right next to it, but one step farther away, is much more spread out. The houses and yards are larger, and it's a little bit more of a country setting, but it is clear that you are still in the city. You have not left the city. You are not in a suburban zone. So you can tell from just Sutiava and Veracruz right next to each other that there is a very clear visible difference between the way that a barrio generally is going to look and feel and the way that a reparto is generally going to look and feel. It goes more or less without saying that the majority of expats who are looking at living in a city, now those who are looking at living in a beach or whatever, that, that's a different scenario, but when you're in a city, Granada, Managua, Leon, uh, Rivas, Matagalpa, typically we like to live either in the center, in the downtown zone, we're willing to pay a little bit of a premium for that, or we want to live in repartos. We want houses with a little bit more space, a little bit more amenities, uh, and we don't necessarily want to be walking in and working in the center of the city. It doesn't make sense. Expats don't generally work that way. So expats have a tendency, but only a tendency, to stay away from the barrios and be attracted to either the city center, they want to be in the hub of activity and be able to just walk out their door and have every restaurant and shopping and all those things like right there, or we want to be just a little bit farther out, we're willing to have a car or we're willing to not go into the city center, maybe we'll have food delivered, that's really popular in the repartos, whereas in the barrios you're much more likely to walk to a restaurant. It, just, it gives a different lifestyle, but it's all just tends to, none of it is strict rules, but you're going to find that repartos tend to attract expats pretty heavily, as do the suburbs and the city centers do, but Barrios, even for expats, has a trend towards discouraging them to want to live there. Not only because Barrio has a negative connotation in American English, but because living in the ring where you're still in the dense city center, but in a poorer area that's in between the, the often nicer repartos with the often very nice and expensive downtown is just a zone that typically doesn't make sense. And the cost difference for a lot of expats can be quite nominal when you're paying 300 for a house in a barrio or you could pay 350 or 400 for a larger house in a reparto. For many expats, that's a no-brainer. But there are exceptions to every rule, and this beautiful space that I'm in right now is inside the barrio, not a reparto. So you can get anything anywhere, and you can certainly find beautiful spaces like this in the city centers too. They just get less and less common. So I hope this little lesson on how we subdivide cities in Nicaragua has been helpful and gives you a kind of guide when you're looking to different areas where you might want to live. It is worth noting that Managua, we talk about this a lot, is like a sprawl of separate villages with each little village area feeling like a kind of entity on its own, and there's very little of a city center. What's happening in Managua is El Centro essentially doesn't exist. Technically, there's a spot that is known as that, but no one thinks of it or treats it that way. 
it is basically a collection of barrios. And when you get really far out, there are repartos, but mostly it is barrios, and some of those barrios are quite large and have subdivisions like villas and colonias. So when you're looking at Managua, you are basically stuck always looking at barrios or maybe repartos as where you want to live. And so don't take that as a negative. And in Managua, definitely treat it a little bit differently than you would in an Esteli or a Matagalpa, where El Centro means something a lot more important or a lot more attractive for you. You probably, if you're going to be in Managua, are going to be picking the barrio that interests you, because if you want to be in Managua, typically you want to be somewhere relatively close to the city and the barrios there, because there isn't a strong city center, it's basically a big collection of barrios and the barrios are very strongly identified as opposed to here in Leon, where even a lot of locals may have a general idea where Saragossa is, but they couldn't actually find it for you on a map or tell you where the barrier is between it and its neighboring uh, barrio like Laborio, even though they touch each other and have a very clear demarcation point where the architecture, the history, the maps change, even though even the signposts change. But most people are not aware of those things, and so they aren't completely clear where those things are going to happen. But if you're in Managua and you're saying, oh, I'm in this barrio, or if you're in Bologna, or you're in uh, Via Fontana, or you're in Los Robles, you're generally able to really clearly uh, say where you are, and everyone knows the areas by those names, and they act like their own separate cities, and you you speak of them as traveling to another barrio in a, in a more clear way than we do in all the other cities. So it's a special beast on its own. Uh, so think of Barrio slightly different in the Managua context. But for the rest of us, it's a pretty consistent thing. And just because I say a lot of expats want to stay away from the Barrios, don't take that as a avoid the Barrios recommendation. I live in a Barrio. I've lived in multiple Barrios. I have find it's a great place to live because you get more for your money, typically. Uh, it's, it's very easy to go out and do things. You have a lot of access to resources. Um, and in some places, like Esteli, for example, there's very little farther out. It's a city with very few repartos. It tends to be all barrios, whereas Leon is a little bit more sprawling with a few more repartos. Some cities are going to be mostly repartos. Some are essentially all barrios. It depends how the city is laid out, where it ends, how much it sprawls, and so forth. So Matagalpa, for example, sprawls a lot, and Esteli extremely little. They're kind of extreme on, on either case. Uh, so it, it depends on your city and it depends on what you want. Don't be afraid of the barrios. In no way does being a barrio imply technically that it's going to be poor or dangerous or anything of the sort. It simply means that it's dependent on the city center. So uh, for a lot of people, that is where you want to be and we just don't realize. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Of course, watch another episode that tells the algorithm that you love this channel and that it should show show more people this content and tell your friends about the show, tell your family, get them to watch and learn more about Latin America and what life can be like down here. And remember that everything we talked about today is unique to Nicaragua. The terms barrio reparto may or may not exist in other Latin American countries. And if they do, they can be used very differently. So it is unique by country, even Honduras, Guatemala, Costa Rica. They're going to use these at least a little bit differently, if not very differently. And I should point out really quickly, just like we use wards in the United States, Guatemala uses zonas. There are a few things that are listed as zona sometimes in Managua, but they're not used the way that you think. They simply use barrio instead of the zonas that Guatemala City would use. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you all tomorrow.